welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. I am your host, Mike Jokum. Jess and Matt are joining me this evening. Guys, how are we? Good. Better than you, I think. I am in a great mood. It is late on a Tuesday evening, and I have a ton of energy. So let's dive right into it. Okay, fine. So guys, racing came back this past weekend. I know it wasn't IndyCar, but... We'll have to deal with that. Uh, NASCAR, it came back. Uh, They raced at Darlington Sunday, and they're also racing again tomorrow night. Yes, tomorrow night on um, uh, primetime, I think, isn't it? Like 7.30 or something? I can't remember. Anyways, so Kevin Harvick won on Sunday with some strict social distancing rules, including rules about pitting, how they did that, keeping crews and drivers and TV personnel, et cetera, all separated. What did you guys think? How did you how did you guys take to it? Did you get a chance to watch any of it? Strictly speaking on what they did procedurally between them and the German Bundesliga and a couple other kind of major sports are starting to open back up. It's kind of just refreshing to see. And you know, as far as what NASCAR did, you know, I think what they did in the pit road, what they did pre-race, what they did with the commentary team, etc. Uh, a lot of people wearing masks. I thought that was really safe. I think they're kind of just proving to people that we can do this if we're just responsible about it. And so I'm excited to see if IndyCar follows suit and does similar sort of measures. Uh, as far as the race itself, I gave it 30 laps and gave up because i was horrendously bored but i know i saw some people out there enjoying it it's just i tried but it's not for me yeah on the safety measures i think they did an excellent job from the media to the teams to everybody at the track they did a really really good job there but the actual race i made it to two-thirds of the way through the competition caution so i don't know five more laps than matt And they were trying to explain the rules of the competition caution during the competition caution. And I realized I had no idea what they were talking about, similar to my pitfall last week. And that's when I decided I've had enough. I it's I didn't like Matt. It's just not really for me. I'm I'm sure I hope people enjoyed it, but I I kind of didn't really watch the rest of it. So I didn't watch all of it. I won't lie. I watched. I don't know. 40 laps at the beginning and then went and did something and then came back and watched 10 more laps and then went and did something and came back and watched a couple more laps. I I didn't see the end even. So I, I know people were saying it was kind of a snooze fest at the end. I agree with the getting totally confused on what the rules were with the caution periods. But as far as the safety stuff went, I thought they did a good job keeping people separated. Um, I think they did good by all, you know, trying to wear masks and um, keep distance between everybody. So I liked that. The one thing that I thought might have been a little bit of overkill was the letting 20 car groups pit at a time instead of letting everyone pit at the same time. I thought that kind of defeats the purpose because then you have, all the crew out there anyways, because if they're putting lap laps back to back, they still are going to have to have the crew out there. They can't like come from the garage in one lap. It just doesn't work. So I thought that was a little bit odd, but Hey, as long as it works, that's all that really matters. I'm just glad that racing is starting to come back. Yes. Agreed. I will probably tune in for maybe the end of the race tomorrow switch it up see if i can see something exciting but anyway we'll move on to some indycar stuff here unfortunately toronto which was scheduled to be the second weekend in july if i'm not mistaken has for now been postponed because the city of toronto banned gatherings of over 250 people through the end of july 
It hasn't officially been canceled because Green Savory Promotions, the city, and IndyCar are working for a date later in the year, but we will have to wait and see on that one. Is anybody really surprised by this decision? And B, do you think we will be heading to Toronto at some point later this year? I, for one, am not surprised. I mean, I I think it was just today that the uh, travel restrictions just got extended also through the end of June. So I was more watching that than what the city of Toronto was doing. But I think it's just, you know, it was a little bit too hopeful to be able to pull it off that quick. Um, As far as do I see it happening sometime later, honestly, no, because it gets colder there much sooner than here. And it just with the time frame of everything going forward, we're already pretty cramped in that last, uh, we'll call it summer heat wave, I guess, so to say. So I think that it would be very difficult to squeeze it in someplace. Not surprised at all. And I honestly don't see it coming back. And you think about it with like a street course to, they need a ample time to build the track. You know, you got concrete blocks, fences, rumble strips, you got the lot that you need to fix up. So I am not entirely sure that this will be back on the schedule in 2020 unfortunately and i really hope that they can get their ducks in a row to make sure that the event doesn't go away permanently for next year because it is a really good track a really good race with some awesome fans yeah i'm i'm not surprised i know Justin and i had talked about it a few times that the border being shut down was definitely going to uh, to hinder the chances of the indycar race happening in july but I am definitely bummed. I I love going to Toronto every year. So I hope it's back on the schedule, but I think Jess is pretty much spot on there. I don't know if there's really a spot for it unless something else gets canceled or, you know, who knows? Crazier things have happened, especially this year. So we could be up for some more changes. Who, Who knows there? So we will move on to the next bit of sort of IndyCar news here. More talk about Ferrari and IndyCar, the speculation is, I guess, increasing that Ferrari will be coming to IndyCar in 2022 with the F1 budget cuts and the team looking to move around some money and and make use of it. Adam Stern actually spoke with Mark Miles that um, he that Mark Miles met with both Lamborghini and Ferrari, I think, last summer about joining IndyCar, which is a pretty interesting Little note there that Mark has been traveling the world talk, talking to other partners. So any thoughts? Do we actually think there is a chance of Ferrari going to IndyCar? Yeah, I, I'll be uh, positive. I think the repeated kind of analysis and more and more articles coming about, out about it only signals positive things. And the team principal of Ferrari, whose name escapes me, hasn't really come out and said no. And I think another positive thing that I think our friend Eric Smith had pointed out was that normally Ferrari is unhappy in F1 and just threatens to quit and would say something like, we're going to IndyCar unless you change this. But this time it seems like, you know, hey, we're willing to accept the budget cuts, we're going to stay in F1 and we're going to build an IndyCar program. So to me, that's really awesome. And then Lamborghini kind of came out of left field. I don't know how that would work, but I did tell my wife that if I could like own a car one day, if I ever won the lottery or whatever, the first thing I would buy for my car would be a Lamborghini. So that'd be really sick to see. She probably said something similar to what my wife would say and said, okay, keep, keep dreaming. Anyway, she said retirement gift, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Anyway, Which I Which for you is like what, 5 years from now? Yeah. Wow. I'm g- I'm going to let Jess go cuz I'm sad. If yours is 5 years away, that means mine's like 2 nope. and a half. <laughs> Don't say it. No. No, we got to make him feel old, not you. <laughs> hey, I would be totally stoked if I only had two and a half more years to work. So, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, as are his my thoughts on Ferrari coming over? Do I think it's going to happen? Nope. Um, <laughs> I have just been 
pretty much saying that the whole time to anybody who would listen because I've had several friends ask me about it and I'm like, nah, nope, don't see it happening. I mean, it would be really neat to see, but I, I just... I don't know. Maybe if they start having some more talks with Mark Miles and Roger Penske or something. But right now, I just am not really seeing it. And then as far as buying a Lamborghini, like, why would you want a souped up Ford? (laughs) Hang on a second. Both of your faces are fantastic. What do you what do you mean? What do you mean this is souped up for? Doesn't Audi own Lamborghini? <laughs> oh my god. Your faces. It was priceless. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Audi loans Lamborghini. Um it it is totally it doesn't even matter. But... Oh, I thought you were talking about like the fact that Ford just lets Lamborghini just do whatever and it soups out. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were saying they're owned by Ford. I'm like, what are you talking about? No. Mostly, I was saying oh. I don't like them because I also don't like Ford. But anywho, um, That's no, you're I, a fiat I, I don't really see either of them coming over, but it would be uh, cool for diecasts, I guess. Do you like Ferrari as like a company? Ferrari is a company, yes. Do you like them as a company? I said yes. Oh, you said they are a company. I'm like, that is not what I asked. No. <laughs> I know that Ferrari is a company, Jess. Ferrari as a company, yes. <laughs> I thought you were saying they are a company. I'm like, what are you saying? They are Chrysler owns Chrysler owns Fiat. No, Fiat owns Chrysler. All right. F-C-A, so Fiat owns Chrysler. North America. <laughs> but then Ferrari is its own thing, right? Correct. They're they they own owned by whoever. Volkswagen or something ridiculous. It's hard to keep track of all who no, owns think, who and all I that. I think Ferrari is its own. Aren't they still their own? I think so. Crap, I don't remember. Anyways, we need like a <laughs> We a need bit. like a spreadsheet. Anyways, we'll move on and just briefly recap uh, F1 silly season because F1 is crazy right now. Do I not get enough a Ferrari opinion? I thought you gave yours. Oh, sorry. You talked. I was giving you crap about your retirement. Go ahead. Yeah. What a jerk. You're like Sebastian Vettel right now. What's that supposed to mean? He's an upstanding citizen. I will leave that at that. I did enjoy sitting back and letting you guys debate the whole Lamborghini thing. That was a lot of fun. But no, Ferrari is not coming into IndyCar. This is just another power play move. I do see the point of the articles, but this is just another... Ferrari whining like they did 20 years ago and building an Indy car. It's probably not going to happen. Okay, Matt, now we can move on. Wow, you really wanted to get that one off your chest. <laughs> I can see why you wanted to go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Jess, anything else before I move on? I feel like I should just, just double check with you real quick. Nope, I'm good. I got my jab in, so. And you like your Fiat. All right, okay. so we're going to recap some F1 silly season news because... It's weird that we're having silly season discussions for any racing series in May. It's kind of bizarre, and especially in Formula One right now, because there's going to be a lot of driver turnover ahead of next year. So we had briefly touched on the show last week, kind of as we were recording, that the hot rumor was Carlos Sainz would be moving from McLaren to Ferrari in 2021, and that is now official. So congrats to Carlos Sainz. He left his seat open in McLaren, and so Daniel Ricciardo is switching from Renault to McLaren for next year, leaving his Renault seat open. They, Renault, have not officially announced anybody yet. However, there are a couple drivers being considered, and one of them is Fernando Alonso. His agent, Flavio Briatore, the former team principal who was disgraced in his last stint, states that Alonso has detoxed himself from racing and feels ready for Formula One again. Uh, Sebastian Vettel, who did leave Ferrari, has not made any official plans yet. I am going to be very sad if he ends up at Mercedes because that's exactly what Formula One needs is the two guys who win everything to just keep winning everything. And one more piece about Alonso is that Fred Watch 2021 is off to a hot start because... Next year's Indy 500 and Monaco Grand Prix will not be on the same Sunday. So there is a chance that he can do both. Guys, 
Any thoughts on anything there? So I did not read the story. Why is Monaco and Indy not happening on the same weekend? It's a good question. Um, I believe Monaco is the 23rd of May and Indy is the 30th. I think it had. So I read the article. There's not a lot of reason given, but there's there's some sort of like a historic race that's like two weeks before the F1 Monaco race. And there's something the week before in Monaco that's not F1 and then F1 in Monaco. I think it's just the way scheduling fell with whoever, you know, who does it. it it's not the, the article is not clear. Matt's not not missing anything there. OK, I just like I said, I, I hadn't read it. I saw the headline, but I hadn't read it. That's interesting, though. I um, mm, man. Fernando, what are you doing to us already? It's 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 not even this year's 500, and we're already talking about next year's 500. And silly season, man. Yeah, I I as far as the other moves, I that's I don't watch enough F1 anymore to really have much of an opinion. But Fernando's given me a headache again. Yeah. As as we said on air last week, that signs article I think came out like ten minutes before Matt and I recorded. So glad for him. Good move for Ricardo as well. I don't know why Alonso would gonna would would want to go to Renault because it's not like they've done anything in a long time. I can't remember the last time they've done something well. Maybe Matt Matt knows more about F one the F one world than I do. Define well. Podium. It's been a while. <laughs> um, I don't know if they've gotten a podium since they've been back. I okay, think, exactly. I don't believe they have. So they came back in 2016, and I don't think they've been on the podium yet. The whole Alonzo detox thing—I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit. I'm over Fred Watch. I'm excited. I'm happy to see him race in Indy, but I'm so tired of the constant news cycle about Fernando Alonso and what cup of coffee he's drinking while he decides where he wants to race next year. I know I'm I sound. Excited. The old guy yelling at the clouds meme. Or yeah, GIF wow. Or... One week after pitfalls, and this is what you've turned back into. <laughs> I'm just, I have Guys, a lot of. I'm glad we're back to normal. <laughs> Man, the I positive... have a lot of frustration. Positivity has just died. It took, oh, we were building oh. up for eight weeks, and it's just out the window. Hey, That's everybody. We are not used to being so positive for so long. We have know, to get right? it out. Hey, everybody. During that stint of eight weeks, I still tried to main some bit of negativity because that's just how I function. I have a lot of positive news to report you. I love Carlos Sainz. I think that should work well. Daniel Ricardo ditching Renault is excellent because I don't really like Renault. I love Fernando Alonso, and I hope he does come back to Formula One because I don't think he's ever going to come to IndyCar full time. So might as well just see him somewhere full time. I do hate the team principal at Renault, though. I think he is a egomaniacal, lackluster leader who makes bad decisions. And so far, Sebastian Vettel doesn't have a deal. I mean, that's all good news to me so far. So I'll be the positive guy here, which is so odd. Not positive was my race last night at Silverstone. We're going to recap our... Xbox, PS4, and PS4 Gran Turismo leagues. So Xbox, we just got done with Silverstone. Uh, I'm not going to dive into what happened to me other than to say I crashed on a complete fluke. If you want to go check out our highlights, they are on the Pit Lane Parlay YouTube channel. Uh, it's something titled Hickey's Onboard Highlights, and this was round 10 at Silverstone. So if you want to go see a complete fluke of an accident, go check that out. Uh, Jake Neely did win again. It's third in a row. Has a big championship lead. And today we finished our draft for the vintage all-star race we're going to do next Monday at Silverstone. So that should be really fun. I got the 76 McLaren. Not super psyched about that. I hate that car. Uh, But I had two choices when it came down to my turn to pick. So it is what it is. Speaking of flukes, Mike, what happened at, at, uh, at France in your league? Well, unfortunately, the PlayStation version of Netcode happened and David Lighting crashed into me on a pure fluke and he he lost his chance to win and he was out of the race. And Michael, the Frenchman, Goodyear, went on to win the race. And then but David Lighting did have a, a victorious um, effort on Sunday in Monza for the Gran Turismo League, which was a lot of fun on Sunday night. 
So I think we're racing at Suzuka in that league this week. So that should be super, super, super fun. I really am struggling in my limited amount of practice so far, but we will move on a quick team pit lane shout out to a few people this week. So let's start with the aforementioned David lighting and also Michael, the Frenchman Goodyear. And last but not least, Let's go with Mr. Stig. Yeah, I think the thing that happened between you and Lighting was especially weird because I don't think the game was quite computing that someone could crash where you crashed. Like, Mike was about to hit the wall at 170 miles an hour, but instead of hitting the wall, the game sent him back into the racing line and it parked him at zero miles an hour, and Lighting, who's coming at 180 miles an hour, just ran right into him because he had nowhere to go. I felt I've never seen that. It's like, and what happened to me, I've never seen that either. So it's just like weird incidents happening back to back to back. Do you know what I'm hearing a lot of right now? This is not a driver's excuse, Jess. Excuses. (laughs) If I... I'm not making excuses. Matt's making excuses. I'm making an excuse for David. I feel bad for him because I just... I don't You know, Mike, it's like he just kept going. Like, no harm, no foul for him. It's not like I went through a corner, spun, and hit the wall. I mean, if I had made my own mistake and crashed, I would just own it. This is, if the game is just weird, it's just weird. Why did you pit that lap? I had to. My tires were gone. Do you think that you should change your number because that would change everything? <laughs> I, <laughs> if I asked Jake Neely, he would say yes because what would Marco do? I mean, <laughs> Neely's gonna clip a blade of grass next race and like, you know what, this number's not working for me anymore. I gotta <laughs> Well, we will move on from that. That was very well played. I think it is time for So, guys, it's been a hot minute. Obviously, last week I totally missed the show uh, due to work, but I think it was, I don't know, two or three weeks before that since we had a Joker lap. So, are you ready for a Joker lap? Probably not. That's a no from both of them. Fantastic. So, this ought to be good then. So, we've discussed what we're all doing with all of our free time and how we're, you know, reading or playing games, whatever. So now we have schedules starting to come together for the majority of racing series in the world. And they're all jacked up. Like, let's be honest, nobody anticipated any of this. So they're just all screwed up. So let's pretend you guys get to make a new schedule. Only I'm not going to have you tell me the whole schedule because we'd be here forever. I just want to know the one track you would throw in there randomly just to throw everybody off, because why not? It's 2020. So where are you sending IndyCar this year for no apparent reason whatsoever? I killed him. I killed him both. <laughs> well, I was giving Matt the chance to go first. <laughs> I'm going to go. We're going to send him over to Europe and go to Spa. Okay. And why? Yes, an international race right now. Brilliant. <laughs> why not? Hey, listen. Just said, just throw it in there and surprise everybody because it's 20. I did say wherever. I was trying to think of an obscure oval in America. Why not Elko? That's in Minnesota, for those who don't know. It's actually like literally my parents' backyard. They host an ARCA race every year. So if you can imagine an ARCA race at a rinky dink track, the safety uh, standards at that track are abysmal, obviously. Uh, it is, I think, of a, th- a third of a mile oval. So it is tiny. So I don't know if 26 Indy cars on that track where there's no pit wall, no safer barriers, uh, no in infield walls. What could go wrong? Yeah, I don't know what could go wrong. If I was going to give like a more serious answer, I'd say Indy cars at Martinsville would be really random. I don't know how that would go. That would be a lot of sending it, full sends, chrome horns. That would be a, you know, iRacing resulted in a lot of hurt feelings. Indy cars at Martinsville would result in a lot of hurt feelings. And those would be legit hurt feelings. Like, I would actually 
feel like they deserved to have hurt feelings. I'm going to say Chicago, since it sounds like Chicago's getting ready to be torn down and turned into a housing development. So why not? I mean, it's going to go bye-bye, so we should see it one more time, right? Um, I think that's I think that's what I'd have to do. I like it. I like both answers. Matt's might be slightly mon- unrealistic, but I have watched YouTube videos there because he's talked about Elko a few times, and it would be unsafe. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Unsafe, yes. Also interesting. Oh, and guys, just to shake things up, because why not? Guess who has the, I don't know, what what are, what are we calling this at this point? The fun driver game question, whatever. The facts <laughs> game. It's just a facts game. Driver facts game. Guess who has that, too? It's me. Okay, so... We're doing it within the last 10 years now, right? Yep. Okay, that's what I thought. It was originally five years, but it said 10 years, so I went with 10 years. All right, so this driver is British. Hold on, I got to flip through my my screens here. Uh, One of the teams that this driver has driven for is Dale Coin Racing. And this person's best finish at Indianapolis for the 500 is fourth. Alex Lloyd. Correct. Good, Good job. Work. Proud of myself. I've gotten that one. It was down very, very obscure answer. I had it down to Conway, Jake's, or Lloyd. Conway would have been my guess. Yeah. Well, I almost screwed it up when I said this the best finish at Indianapolis. And that's when I had to say the 500 because he won. He won in. Uh, whatever indie pro or infinity pro whatever it was back then we should do a history episode one day of all the names of indie lights and the <laughs> series underneath it would take hours the irl pet boy series infinity <laughs> pro indie pro i don't know gosh it just goes on and on and on well on that note i think it's time for everybody's favorite segment of the week And now it's time for Pit Lane Parlay's Pitfalls of the Week. So I will start it out since we were talking about NASCAR, and my pitfall is NASCAR Twitter. NASCAR, you had your first race this weekend. Everybody should be excited about racing. We all watched NASCAR here, so we were excited to see racing. And I'm just going to call out two in particular. So it looks like NASCAR is boycotting the fans to me, and we should boycott NASCAR when the fans get to attend the races. And then let's see if I can find this other one here. So Marty Smith at ESPN posted a short clip of just engines going around the track and how nice it sounded. And somebody said, what a slap in the face to those fans that planned on attending. First off, this race... That was on Sunday, didn't exist until two weeks ago. So I don't think anybody really planned to attend it. And B, does anybody know what's going on in the world right now? I mean, I know Twitter apparently doesn't. At least a few people on Twitter don't. But I mean, those weren't the only two comments that that struck me as really dumb. I'm just going to leave it at that because I'll probably say much worse. It's mind boggling how some people just really have no idea. Jess, did you know there's a pandemic going on right now? Nope. What wow. are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know, but I really wish NASCAR would let me go to the race. I'm getting real annoyed by this whole not getting to go to the racetrack thing. It's a slap in our faces. I'll go next. Mine is on a next level level of nonsense. I'm not sure if you guys saw this. So Connor Daly released his new livery, or I guess Ed Carpenter Racing did for Connor Daly at the Indianapolis 500. And he's running a, basically what it boils down to is a Chuck Yeager tribute for the Air Force. And Chuck Yeager's Twitter account tweeted something along the lines of, hey, my wife wants to know what's up with this livery, blah, blah, blah. We weren't consulted, blah, blah, blah. And then his wife's Twitter account, Victoria Yeager, kind of took over and commented and, Everybody started commenting on her tweets and she was basically saying that they weren't consulted and they have no right to use his name and anything like that. It's almost like they've never heard of what a tribute livery is. 
it's paying tribute to Chuck Yeager. I mean, I don't understand how that's a bad thing. And they're making it sound like Air Force, Connor Daly, Ed Carpenter Racing, etc., are going to be making millions and millions and millions of dollars on the fact that Connor Daly is going to be young, running a Chuck Yeager livery for one race. I'm pretty sure if we look at like the black and white fine print that they're probably going to lose money on this. I don't know, and especially with there's no crowd at Indy this year or whatever happens with the Indianapolis 500 this year. It, they're making it sound like they're getting robbed from the Air Force trying to pay tribute to Chuck Yeager. So I thought the whole thing was completely unnecessary. I don't know why they were putting up such a stink. I really just wish they would kind of take a step back and go, wow, that's a really nice tribute uh, for the race that's normally on Memorial Day to be paying tribute to one of the great American heroes of our time. So to me, it was a little disheartening and uh, I wish they would just see for, see it for what it is, which is a nice tribute. Yeah. It's a shame that people have to, I don't know, act the way they're acting about it. I, I, I would have taken it nicely, but obviously they're clearly not. Yeah. I, and if you read the comments on, his tweet i'm pretty sure it was just her tweeting on his account but no nobody really agreed with her and i didn't you know i didn't spend hours reading twitter comments unfortunately but i don't not not many people really agreed with with what he or his wife were saying so i'll just leave it at that yeah it was it was very silly and a, a very unfortunate thing i hope it doesn't hang over connor daly's head like a lot of past unfortunate incidents have seemed to hang over his head in the past couple of years. Yeah. And sorry, I lost my voice at the end of mine, but uh, yeah. And with the whole thing is they're also like mad at Connor for some reason, as if I'm pretty sure most of the time the driver doesn't really get to say as far as what livery they're running. It's kind of up to the team and sponsors. So I don't understand why they're mad at Connor, but anyways, moving on. Yeah, I did see the Air Force uh, sent out a multi-part tweet and basically um, to sum it up without being too harsh, they kind of said to shove it and they were going to use it because they owned it. So um, my pitfall is kind of random. Formula E has some interesting rules when it comes to weight specifications on the car and driver, including helmets and seats and everything else. It's all included. Um, And back in the day, that was kind of the norm, I guess, so to speak. But now it's kind of gotten away from that because people have realized that Forcing the drivers to regulate their weight in order to gain an advantage is clearly not a healthy thing to do. And these are world-class athletes. Um, But Formula One is, or I'm sorry, Formula E is still doing this. And um, there was an article that came out this week that basically one of the drivers is saying he's literally constantly sick because he is trying to keep underweight. Um, to gain an advantage. And instead of gaining an advantage, he's actually becoming very sick because of it. So I'm just kind of shaming Formula E for not thinking about the health of their drivers when they're talking about weight distribution. Um, I think that there should be a very easy way to fix this in the future. Hopefully, I know they are working on some rules for next year that make it a little bit better, but still not a ton. I think drivers can add, it's like 10 kilograms or something next year, and it really doesn't affect them. But that's really not that much in the grand scheme of things. They need to make it so that the driver's weight really doesn't matter, in my opinion. Yeah, and I agree. And it was kind of cool to see Marcus Erickson share his side of it because I don't think a lot of people will know that side of the sport. And I'm not an expert on the manner, but he was saying that in the world of IndyCar, it's much better. So I, that's good news for him. And uh, hopefully his lifestyle is much more conducive to what he wants rather than trying to maintain a certain weight like he had to do in Formula One. Yeah, I mean, some of those, I did see that it was good for Marcus for speaking up, but some of the formula E guys, if you look at their social media, they they literally look like they're, they're like the size of a tree branch. They're so skinny. 
Uh, so I can't imagine that being healthy, especially if you're getting sick on a race weekend just to, you know, because you're trying to maintain a certain weight. That's not healthy in the long run, and there's can be serious complications from that. So uh, very, very good find there, Jess. I didn't see that until after you talked about it the other day. Yeah, I hope that they uh, look into changing it because obviously forcing a driver to be underweight is is not okay. Agreed. So I think that wraps it up this week. And guys, because Texas is now two weeks away from the time you are listening to this, maybe a little bit more than two, two weeks in a day, so that means next week will be our season re-preview episode. Obviously, the schedule might still change slightly, so we might have to do a third preview at some point. But we are going to have some fun with this. We'll we'll rehash some of the old questions that we had a couple months ago, probably come up with some new ones and uh, do, a, do a new 2020 preview for what we have ahead of us in the IndyCar world. So unless there's anything else, and I'm getting a no from both of you guys, Jess, go ahead and sign us off. And guys, keep your lug nuts tight.